Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be with this group. It's always wonderful to have the opportunity to share the city's work. Uh, and because all of you are part of that work, uh, the, you know, I always say that, you know, working for the city, we're nothing more than sort of facilitators and process managers to help our community reach the goals that everyone wants to reach. I know I just scanned through who's here in the room and I know some of you well, but there's a lot of new names. So for those who know our work well, I hope this is a useful update and it's good to see you because I see some folks that I've worked with a lot. And for those who are new, I hope that this is helpful. Um, this is informal, stop me anytime, ask questions. I have you know, 15, 20 minutes of presenting. If you ask lots of questions, then I can talk at you a little bit less and we can make this more interactive. Um, I will, let me pop up the chat so that I can see that also. And then I'll dive in. Where did it go? Oh, I just went to my next slide. And I can also help you monitor the chat in case people type in a question. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, interrupt me anytime. Feel free to uh, hop in the chat. There it is. All right, I can get it up. Just have to get the little window to appear. All right, feel free to interrupt me anytime. I'll try to watch the chat too. But let's dive in. So, city and county of Denver has set climate goals in our 80 by 50 action plan that was released in 2018. And then last year in 2020, the Denver Climate Action Task Force made a whole number of recommendations to the city, not all of which we've adopted as our own, but that we're taking very seriously and evaluating and seeing how far we can get towards all of those recommendations. And the big change was that the Denver Climate Action Task Force said, Denver, you gotta get to net zero energy by 2040. So we're gonna do what we can to get there. And I'll tell you about the work in building. So I wanna start with just a high level overview. What are we doing to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in buildings? Above the line is all of our work in new buildings and everything that's blue is complete. So I'll touch on it, but we have a net zero energy new buildings implementation plan that lays out how we will have all new buildings be net zero energy by 2030. And this year we will be going through a code update process and I'll touch on this more also later in the presentation to take the next step towards net zero energy new buildings and follow that implementation plan. And below the line, looking at existing buildings, the Climate Action Task Force said, get to net zero energy by 2040. And so we're doing a strategic existing building electrification implementation plan that I'll talk about. And currently we're running the Energize Denver Task Force, which will design a policy to get existing buildings to net zero energy by 2040, not 2020. 240, 2040. Um, and so I'll tell you about that a little overview of where we're going and where the work is at. So again, just to kind of dive a little deeper into what the Climate Action Task Force told us to do, they, there was 26 diverse members representing all the different sectors from our emissions and the different people from across the community who are advocates. Um, we had a lot of public engagement and they made a whole bunch of recommendations specific to buildings and homes, which is the work I lead. You can go get the whole report to see all of their recommendations, but the really big new one is on the far right here where they said, get all existing buildings to net zero energy by 2040. So have zero heating emissions, um, use 50% less energy. These are really ambitious goals. And they had some pretty ambitious interim targets for us that I wanna make sure and point out. They said that in, by 2025, our building code should ensure all homes are net zero emissions. And then it said by 2030, all new buildings are net zero energy. So these are the goals we're working towards. The next thing the Climate Action Task Force recommended was that 
city council refer a sales tax to the ballot to fund our office and all the work to reach these goals. So, and that passed on the ballot in November of 2021. So we have 30 to $40 million every year. And we're, there's six allowable uses for those funds. Half the funds must endeavor to have a strong lens towards equity, race, and social justice. And we're gonna really focus on exceeding that. Uh, we're gonna try to spend most of the funds in a way that both addresses climate change and advances racial equity. And so we're really right now looking at how do we um, kind of balance that money and weigh different priorities. This pie chart is just a, theory, a sort of hypothetical. We will have a five-year plan for spending for the Climate Protection Fund developed by November. And Celeste can tell you um, at least a little bit more because I know she was involved with the Climate Action Task Force, but also she sits on our Buildings and Homes Committee that will be advising us on all of our work, but especially how we use these funds. And they're just kicking off that advisory work. So we haven't gotten too far in yet, but by November, we will have a plan. So next, I wanted to just to tell you about our existing buildings and homes work. So to frame existing buildings and homes, why does this matter? What is the scale of the problem? Buildings and homes account for 64% of Denver's greenhouse gas emissions. And of that, it's 15% homes, single family homes, 49% is commercial and multifamily buildings. And of that 49% that is commercial and multifamily buildings, get 82% of the square footage from 3,000 of the largest buildings. And there's 14,000 small buildings that cover 18% of the square footage. So we can't get to net zero energy if we don't do anything about 14,000 smaller buildings, but it's a much more challenging group to regulate and to figure out what um, is the kind of really effective policy. Um, someone asked that they thought the task force recommendations were the same as voter approved 2A. Um, yes. So the Climate Action Task Force recommendations led to the voter approved 2A for the Climate Protection Fund. Uh, sorry, I just saw the question, so it's taking us back a couple slides. I will get into the full timeline for how we plan to advance to net zero energy for new buildings by 2030. Um, but know that 2030, we need all buildings to perform as net zero energy. You're, I think the person is getting at when will we electrify, which I'll get to, but it will be 2024 for homes and 2027 for um, existing, uh, for, for commercial buildings. But that's all new buildings that the person is referring to, I think, in their question. So onward with existing buildings for now. I'm sorry, I just saw the question. So existing buildings, square footage, by sector, you have a lot of multifamily buildings, apartments, condos, followed by offices, municipal buildings, hotels, warehouses, other. So the Energized Denver Task Force is helping the city currently working to design a building performance policy for existing buildings to improve health and equity, create jobs, and drive climate solutions in existing buildings that achieve net zero energy by 2040. Here you can see who the Energized Denver Task Force members are. And Celeste is one of our task force members along with the building owners and managers from each of the major building types in Denver. We've got our utility Excel energy as well as some oil and gas interests, affordable housing, in neighborhood development interests, labor, environmental interests. And the goal is that all these people reach consensus on a recommendation around what requirements we should put in place for existing buildings in Denver. Here you can see what other cities have an existing building performance policy. Orange is cities that have the policy already in place. 
blue is to cities with a policy under development. And here you can see the schedule for the task force. So they've only met three times out of, we think, eight meetings. Next Thursday, so a week from today, the task force will meet to talk for the first time kind of in depth about specific policy options on energy efficiency and renewable electricity. And then we will turn to how to reduce heating emissions and electrification in June and July. And the way we frame the goal for the Energize Denver Task Force is this, it's the open bars on this graph. So if you turn to the left side of the graph, you can see the electricity carbon emissions in blue this last year in 2020 and the natural gas or fossil gas carbon emissions in yellow. And what we need to get to is entirely open bars, net zero energy by 2040. Our goal is not that every existing building is net zero energy on site. It's that it's net zero energy. We are net zero energy across all buildings on net across the city. And so, you know, buildings will need to contribute energy efficiency and solar to open up a lot of the blue bars uh, in some way through the policy that we develop. And then we'll need to move off of fossil gas to reduce the yellow emissions by 2040. So the task force is the next two meetings are really figuring out how to balance energy efficiency and renewables, what kind of requirements to put in place. Um, I just saw there was another question in the chat. I don't always spot them as they come in. Um, the question I think was on this chart, what was the Y axis? And the Y axis is the emissions in tons of carbon emissions. It is greenhouse gas. Um, so getting in to balancing energy efficiency and renewables, um, I'll get to the question on electrification just in a moment. Um, someone asked a great question, but so we'll, the next two months are figuring out how to balance energy efficiency and renewables. And then, then June and July the task force will focus on the transition to renewable electric heat. And a few notes about this, um, heat pumps are two to 300% efficient. And so they can reach cost parity for operations if um, with natural gas, even though electricity is more expensive because um, they are so much more efficient. And we have our electrification implementation plan that we are kind of finalizing, but that's what our cost numbers are showing. Sometimes to reach cost parity on operations, we do need to keep gas back up because on the very coldest days, when you would be running electric resistance heat or that's the heat pump runs on electric resistance heat on the very coldest days, it's hard to keep at cost parity for um, without the gas backup. So what you see a picture of here is an example of a rooftop heat pump where uh, it has gas backup built in. And this is the kind of system that should be really easy to kind of plug and play on existing buildings. You take an existing rooftop unit that has a furnace and an air conditioner in it and you drop in a heat pump with gas backup instead. The heat pump can heat and cool and is sort of just, you just drop a different box on the roof and the box costs about the same amount up front. And with the gas backup, it costs about the same amount to, oper to run and operate over time. So some buildings are quite easy to convert is what we're finding uh, with at cost parity today. And that's a lot of the small offices where it gets more challenging is where buildings get taller. So someone asked a question about downtown. Um, downtown is more challenging when you have boilers and chillers and it, the way the heat is moved and distributed around the building is more complicated. I'm sure all of you know all the technical <laughs> details of that. Um, a lot of these are going to be sort of 
custom designs on how much you can electrify. There's cases where you could just replace the chiller with a heat pump and provide some of the heating load of the building and get 80% of the way there. There's other cases where that is not going to work. Um, and so I think uh, that is, and we're still running the numbers on exactly what percent of our building stock that is, but Denver doesn't have that many buildings that are the tall buildings, right? There's 14,000 of those small buildings that all have these little rooftop units on them. Um, and there's a lot more warehouses and box stores and retail stores and other, you know, schools, although we don't regulate schools, um, but municipal buildings, there's a lot of low flat buildings. So um, we will have the numbers out by June with our electrification plan and it will show kind of what happens with the grid because they saw a question come in around that. Um, and uh, the grid, um, even if we just put in regular heat pumps without gas backup, um, the, there's enough space with our summer peak that the winter peak doesn't start to exceed the summer peak anytime soon. Um, we can, you know, go a long ways towards electrification on the order of getting halfway there to all electric with even kind of the poorest heat pumps out there today before we stress the grid at all. Um, and as technology improves or where we keep gas back up, it will make it that much easier for the grid. Now there may be certain parts of the grid that are harder like downtown. So we will have to keep designing to that, but generally the story on the grid is it's fine. So since I was seeing questions about that, um, and it will be a 20 year transition. So Excel can solve the problem where it's not completely fine today. Um, what we want to avoid is having electric resistance backup. Someone asked about why not, um, Jamie asked, why not just have electric resistance as the backup? Um, then you have to have panel upgrades in a lot of existing buildings and that's expensive. And the electric resistance is expensive when you operate the building. Um, so it's great if someone wants to go all electric and do the panel upgrade and pay the electric resistance bill when they operate the building. I don't think though that it will be up to the task force to decide, but my guess is that the task force isn't gonna put that in as like a base requirement when your rooftop unit fails today. Um, but I think we wanna encourage it and we wanna encourage people to do energy efficiency to offset those costs, um, right? So there are solutions to go all electric, but it is more expensive in our numbers today if you don't keep some of the gas back up. Okay, that was a lot, uh, but I think I got through most of your questions. There was one on, just came in, does the PUC allow Excel to incentivize fuel switching? We're working on it. Excel does offer incentives for heat pumps and electrification, but we're working to make those stronger. Um, it's, they don't directly incentivize fuel switching today. We sort of need a different structure than just a DSM program um, because you're not seeing the same kind of savings. What you're going for is carbon savings, not energy savings. You're going to kind of get at cost parity. And so the um, program design is something we're going to be advocating to change to really enable electrification. Okay, new buildings, because I know that uh, I want to pass this off to Celeste and Taylor to tell you more. New buildings. The goal is to get to net zero energy new construction by 2030 because by 2050, 40% of our building stock will be new. There's lots of new buildings. And my understanding is this group works with lots of new buildings, right? So they got to use half as much energy. Um, they need to be all electric. Here's our path to go through code to net zero energy by 2030. The 2019 Denver energy code was 15% better for commercial buildings than the 2018 IECC that it was based on because of all the amendments that Denver passed. There were just the common sense first steps on energy efficiency. And um, the Denver Green Code is more efficient than that, which is a voluntary code. Every code cycle, we will roll things from Denver Green Code into the base code, and we will adopt a new Denver Green Code. So that's what we will be doing this year is um, updating both the base code and the Denver Green Code. And every three years, we will go through um, that update. Um, of course, the Green Buildings Ordinance layers on top of that with the requirements for either energy efficiency and solar, energy efficiency or solar, um, or some combination of green space and energy efficiency or solar. Um, there's a lot of flexible options here, but a number of buildings are picking um, increased energy efficiency um, as their path through 
the green building ordinance. This is always additional um, to code. I'll turn back to the questions. Um, I'm just going to get through kind of this slide. So I wanted just to show kind of how does this compare to other cities and compares to other cities um, because here you can see sort of which other cities and states, because often code is at the state level, really who has a net zero goal and policies in place. And we're on that list, right? We have a goal and we have a current code that is 15% better for commercial buildings than the national code. Um, how are we doing on new building electrification codes compared to others? Uh, the dark blue cities are the ones and there's all of California cities, all those ones listed there, 40 of them are dark blue, have actual electrification requirements, either gas bans or strong incentives for electrification, where you have to do a lot of efficiency if you want to put gas in, um, in place. So that's Rhode Island for state buildings, Seattle, um, and then all these cities in California. And then there's a lot more cities, as you can see, that are kind of like us that are starting to either consider or pass a electrification policies, what was on kind of the list for this year would be to go for Denver to go electrification ready. And I'll kind of get into that. That's all laid out in our net zero energy implementation plan. So 150 pages tells you the whole path of what we want to have happen in every single code cycle. And I'll just highlight some of those. So this chart is in the plan. You can Google the plan, go through all the details, but um, I really want to call your attention um, to the all electric rows because I was getting questions about that. Um, all electric ready um, is suggested in 2021 and is that the plan? And then we would go all electric um, for um, except water heating in 2024 for commercial and for residential it would be all electric in 2024. And then in 2027 would be all electric for including water heat. Uh, the commercial water heating can get more complicated. So that one was um, more delayed. The other thing I wanna call your attention to is the shift in energy modeling. So um, we want to increase modeling accuracy and also move towards modeling that um, meets a uh, target EUI instead of modeling against a baseline uh, because then we can include things like unregulated loads in the model and um, and the building is just going to have to perform as designed and that's the goal in 2030 like the real definition of net zero right is that the building um, is performing as designed. And so there's going to be kind of a shift, I think, in what modeling is required in code that's laid out in the plan. Okay, here's the residential code timeline. And again, you can see all electric is what's in the plan in 2024 and 2021. The plan is to pass requirements for conduit and panel space. Now remember, everything in the net zero implementation plan has to actually go through the code committees and be approved. So um, get involved in our stakeholder groups, um, get involved in um, the code committees. We will be announcing all of that. And you can sign up on our website if you kind of go to our, if you go to our office's website and I'll walk through, I'll have to, I can post the link in the chat because it's not incredibly easy to find. So once I stop talking, I'll just go paste it. If you want to follow, um, sign up for our net zero new buildings list and you'll get every, all the updates about what happens with the code update. This year, here's the process. We'll start with kind of working with um, working groups of whoever's interested in advising us on what should the city propose in terms of amendments. We'll request public amendments so all of you could submit amendments. Then there'll actually be um, technical committee meetings, and then it will go uh, get published and go to city council for a vote. Okay, so with that, let me turn to the questions, because I was uh, finding it a little difficult to toggle back and forth. So um, let me scroll back up. Great case study from Byron Rogers Federal Office Building. Great example from Fort Collins.
won't the last bit to zero be harder? I'm not sure it will. Um, so to go back to the charts here, um, because remember, we're not trying to get to net zero energy on every single building. We want to get there as a community of all of Denver's buildings. And so um, we are going to go as far on every individual building as um, makes sense financially, where the development community is ready. We're going to push the envelope, but not um, not to the point of sort of ridiculousness, right? Like we need to push the envelope and be more efficient and get solar and renewables installed. But we also, um, we need to be all electric. And then we need to just have enough renewables on the system and Excel is offset to be 80% renewable by 2030. So heat pumps are a carbon win today. They only get better as Excel goes to 80% renewable on our grid by 2030. We have a goal for the city to be 100% renewable by 2030. Buildings will contribute some to that. We'll build community solar gardens. And so um, as, as long as we meet and we'll, you know, we'll keep pushing Excel to do more. And I think that as long as we are 100% renewable on our grid by 2030, then um, we need to be efficient to enable that. And we need to be all electric. And the studies show that all electric buildings are cheaper to build, cheaper to operate. You don't have to run natural gas lines to them. Uh, I think the range is eight to 27% cheaper to build for um, commercial buildings and two to 10% cheaper to operate. Uh, so I think that this can get, can be really cost effective of anything. These are, um, because it's just one system, right? The heat pump heats and cools. Um, and so uh, in some ways they're a simpler building. And um, and so I think we can do this in a way that really works and where the last bit isn't, isn't actually harder. It's a shift in sort of monitoring to performance, but they're just gonna fall under our performance policy we're developing with the Energized Denver Task Force anyway. So they're all gonna have to perform as designed as will all buildings. So um, let me go back. I lost the chat, pull it back up. Um, we're working on Excel to make sure that rooftop solar does pay back, especially for commercial buildings. So we are working kind of as advocates at the PUC um, to make sure that more uh, buildings can um, install solar and have a really good return. But good point that if it doesn't have a payback, then it might not make sense to require buildings to be solar ready, right? Uh, that's the kind of thing we need people weighing in on in our process. Um, and the skill of operators is so key, right? That's why we're gonna have the building performance policy developed by the Energized Denver Task Force so that um, we have a lot of support from the city for our operators of our buildings and they're getting, um, they have accountability to having to perform as they were in the case of new buildings designed to perform. And there will be options like, oh, you have to do a tune up if you fall a little bit short or we'll see what the task force comes up with, right? Um, it will be up to them to figure it out, but, um, and they'll have to decide how much do we really try to regulate that performance? Like we wanna do some, but at the end of the day, if we can build enough renewables and electrify everything, um, we, the, the task force is gonna need to weigh, and I think we're gonna end up doing scenario planning in the future to weigh, like how much do we really have to drive the efficiency? Um, we're always looking for the common sense, low cost option to get to these solutions right now that is energy efficiency, but will it always be? Um, we'll see. And I think that um, I hear the task force talk about like wanting to have some flexibility and do scenario planning to update things in the future, but we'll see um, where they go with that. Um, and what else do I have? Am I getting to all the questions? I think I got through most of them. Someone's question feel like it wasn't answered. Jump in. You can just talk to me. I'll stop sharing. I'll pass it to Celeste and Taylor to tell you all the things. Yeah, I was just gonna say I think that's a that's a good segue into the next presentations. Thank you very much, Katrina. And yeah. um yeah, I'll have this chat open and I can um if you have to jump off now, I can email these questions to you. Um if you wanted to yeah, reply to them. I think I kind of touched at least on most of them that I read. So let me know if folks tell you there's gaps. And sure. uh, it was wonderful being with all of you. Thank you for your time. And I know Celeste and Taylor will have lots of good info. Bye everyone. Cool. Thanks Katrina. Thanks for, thanks for having me. All right.
Cool. So that covers the, the more policy and co-development side for Denver's plans. So our next two presenters are going to um, come from more of the, the building energy use, simulation, performance analysis side. We have uh, two teammates from Group 14 Engineering, local firm here in Denver, uh, Celeste Sizik and Taylor Roberts. Uh, Celeste is a professional engineer and principal at Group 14 and oversees the existing building and monitoring based commissioning services. She has over 18 years of experience in the building systems field with mechanical system design, retro commissioning, energy audits, energy training, and building analytics. Celeste has supported the City of Denver climate initiatives with participation on the 80 by 50 committee, climate action task force, and the current Energized Denver Task Force and other technical support. Taylor is a professional engineer and project manager at Group 14 on the energy team, focusing on whole building energy modeling. He has over nine years of experience in the building energy field, including energy consulting and energy modeling for code compliance, lead, and utility rebate programs. Taylor supported the City of Denver Climate Initiatives with participation on the Denver Net Zero Committee, for commercial and multifamily new construction. So I'm gonna let Celeste and Taylor take it away. Thanks, Aaron. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, appreciate sure. it. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna all step here in and kind of take a deeper dive into the next code cycle and kind of what's going on uh, with that practitioner's lens um, for new construction commercial, specifically commercial and multifamily. And then Celeste will take over the last bit of time and she'll talk about existing buildings. Um, so if you are on Denver's Net Zero Committee, I know a bunch of people on here are, this will all be information you already know, but for everyone else, it should be pretty interesting. Um, so I'll just kind of talk over just real quick what uh, Katrina mentioned, you know, how do we get to 15% better for this code cycle that everyone's complying with right now? What is that? And then I'll focus most of my time on what does that new code look like? This is all, you know, this has not been approved or anything. This is what the city's talking about, right? So we're kind of in that cycle now where uh, this is the plan based on that net zero plan. Um, and then through these working groups and all those things that Katrina showed, they'll put it into code and then they're planning to adopt it in December of this year, right? So I'm kind of giving you the look, look ahead. So it's not 100% there. Also touch on GBO, uh, Green Building Ordinance, which Katrina talked about a little bit. And then the final part talk, touch on electrification and, and net zero. So just a little bit deeper dives into what Katrina was talking about. Um, so first thing real quick, I know most of you are familiar with this and you're having to comply with it, but the, with uh, your projects, but the two big thing, two big mandatory items that Denver changed in their code this year to help with that energy efficiency and all their carbon goals were, uh, you have to do thermal envelope testing now. So all of our buildings have to be uh, blower door tested, pressurized testing to see if they have big holes in them. Um, you don't have to really meet a requirement right now. It's not very stringent, um, but they plan on cranking that down the next code cycles. And then a big one too is EV charging, right? So now all, all uh, buildings have to have EV charging uh, if you have large parking areas. So. Those are the two new mandatories. And then kind of the where they got most of their efficiency was on your pathways. So on your prescriptive pathway, you had to do um, com check and two additional efficiency packages in C406 in lieu of just one. And they made lighting, which is what everyone does a lot harder. You have to be 30% uh, better instead of 10% better for lighting. And then performance, right? Doing the energy model, what we all probably deal with the most. Um, Essentially, they just added a 9% cost savings requirement on top of the existing one. Uh, it was a little more complicated than that, as you can do ASHRAE, you can do IECC, and if you do ICC, you can do costs or energy, but essentially they just made it about 10% harder for the modeling pathway to, to chew that up. So that's kind of where we are now. Katrina showed this slide, which is a really good slide of really what happened in the past code cycle was kind of Denver trying to meet their goals and knowing they had a code cycle. And now they've had a lot more time to plan. So this is kind of their plan. I'm gonna focus on 2021, but it's really interesting to look at all these um, to kind of see where the city thinks they're going, right? And this is still, it needs to be adopted and approved by city council and everything. Um, 
but uh, it is really interesting. So 2021, I'm going to focus on the energy modeling. And the big change there is that second row, um, meet EUI targets by type and year. So we've always modeled to a baseline, right, to show code compliance. This next 2021 code cycle, they're planning on changing that and having EUI targets. And that's really what I'm going to kind of focus on. Um, they also have a lot of other interesting things. And if anyone's familiar with Boulder's energy code, it's going to look very similar, right? So the Denver and Boulder are working together. The documentation now is very, very similar. Um, and they're adopting some of the same things in their requirements. So Boulder currently has a backstop. And I know one of those questions was on it, but a efficiency backstop, which is a common theme now as towns and municipalities want to have more, um, I guess, give teams more freedom in the modeling pathway. They want to have backstops to make sure the buildings are still performing uh, if something goes wrong. So those IEC thermal envelope. Um, and I know one of those questions was about, you know, the carbon emissions and the envelope and everything. And I think these backstops, what they're thinking about, right, is they want to be able to give developers enough freedom that they're not feeling like the city's just adding a ton of cost to their project and the modeling pathway gives them that. Requiring a ton of insulation is a really costly thing. It, you know, we know it works, but it's it's not cheap first cost. Um, so I think that's kind of where they they want to require some, but they don't want to push it too hard because um, that's one of the, you know the the carrots they give developers is hey you can you know figure out a way to do this that's not crazy expensive um, if you go the modeling pathway. Um, so yeah, we can dive into those EUIs and kind of this new modeling approach that the city wants to take. So uh, the, again, these are rough. These are what the city's looking at now. And if you're on that net zero committee, you know, you seen, saw these a couple months ago. Um, I think they'll continue to develop them. Uh, but what we have going on here is this Denver benchmarking uh, site EUI median. So they're using Energized Denver um, to look at all these buildings that have to report their energy use as kind of like a baseline. And then they using like energy models, right, to see this site EUI estimate for the current code. Um, and then this net zero is where they want to be um, for that final, you know, net zero code. And then this is the implementation between. So for these different building types in the next code, the plan is you will, if you fall under one of these, you know, you will model to this EUI and submit that um, and right you don't have to model a baseline there won't be all of that it's it's do the proposed model to see what the ui is um, there's a lot of questions around that obviously which i'll get to and then uh and then right in the future plans which katrina was saying is well then the building has to show what its ui is and then you have to report on discrepancy and finally the final step would be that you know it needs to perform to what it was modeled to uh to, to for code compliance and then these are the ones for multifamily. So again, right, the same thing, but to kind of get you an idea in the, in the th you know, mid thirties is what the city's looking at. Um, this is a little bit higher than Boulder's current code, um, but, you know, similar again, and then it ratchets down, right, as, as it progresses. So Taylor, I got a, a few questions in the chat that just popped up about these two tables. Um, I guess, would you prefer people to unmute themselves and ask questions? Yeah, I think I can. So Jamie asked one that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> um, the yeah. Energized Denver median 40th percentiles, you know, that's, and the, I have the same question, Jamie. I don't know exactly where these numbers are coming from. And I assume in the next few months, the city's going to work with uh, practitioners in the industry to really fine tune these. Um, yeah, this next question I'll kind of get to. I think there's a lot of questions, right, about issues with performance modeling, but that's definitely where the city wants to go. And I have a slide on that. Yeah, Scott's question. So the voter approved action was for a tax. Um, so I think there's a little bit of confusion there. So that the task force uh, gives recommendations to the city and then the city received a tax. 
I don't think the task force or the city's required to do what the task force is. I think they're doing the best of their abilities to. But I, again, I'm pretty sure 2A was just that tax. But again, that's probably more a question for Katrina. Um, and then, yeah, uh, Anna had a great question that when this was presented um, at the Net Zero Task Force, we all brought up is why is the a medium and large office building EUI so different if you're like 1,000 square feet, if you're over 100 or under 100, it's way different. That, that doesn't really make any sense. So again, I think they need to work on these dials and fine tune them. And you can interrupt me too, sorry, because the chat like disappears when I'm going through sure. slides. Yeah, so for everybody. Um... I was going to say, I can add on to that comment about the task force. I participated in that. And what Taylor said is correct, that they made recommendations, but Denver did not formally say that those are the new goals. So they have not taken those on as formal goals and that was not connected to the voter approved tax. The tax was just to fund the climate office and it can be spent on all those things that Katrina showed in the pie chart. They don't have to necessarily attach that to meeting those goals. Yeah, thanks Celeste. Uh, sure. Yeah, Celeste is all, all things for the task force. She was in all those meetings. So she has a wealth of knowledge on that. Um, that, you know, the city recognizes that we can't do EUIs for everything. There's weird buildings, right, that we all work on. Um, so there'll still be a baseline for those, those targets. Right now they're looking at ASHRAE 90.1 2016 um, and, and these percents better, right, which is pretty significant percents better there. Um, and, but yeah, that's kind of what they're tracking for those other ones. Um, I think this slide is kind of what everyone's asking questions about. And I think this is where the city wants to get a lot more input from energy modelers is, um, and I'll, I'll go through this and then get to those questions. Um, right, so Boulder kind of approaches by saying, okay, you know, you have to use our schedules. Um, I, this city of Denver, I don't know if they're gonna go that way, um, but you know, plug loads, occupancy schedules, all this stuff is, kind of right now not really regulated under the energy code. So when you go to EUI, do you want to regulate it? Do you want to let practitioners do, you know, what they think is best? And then if, you know, the building's required to meet it and our schedules are junk, is it on us? Um, so I think there's a lot of questions around that. I have a lot of questions on like ventilation, right? We were talking multifamily. If you're not requiring ventilation in multifamily, you could just do natural ventilation, which is basically no ventilation and have a great UI with a crappy building. Um, so I think this also plays into other codes, right? Does Denver need to require ventilation uh, for, for multifamily, which they traditionally haven't. Um, so yeah, really that normalization, right? I know California too has looked at a lot of jurisdictions have of requiring schedules to be used, requiring uh, plug, certain plug loads to be used. Um, and I think the city's looking at that and it's hard questions. Those backstops we talked about, right? So it, essentially the backstop, if people aren't familiar with that is the performance paths, you don't have to meet any of the insulation requirements. A backstop is you do. So they're not the current IECC, whatever, but there may be a year previous and you have to meet all those, those are mandatory. Um, so that kind of changes things a little bit. And then, yeah, with energy modeling accuracy, right, the end goal is that we model the building, it does an EUI for code compliance, and then the building operates at that. That has a ton of factors in it. I like to call it predicting the future, right, <laughs> is what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, lease rates, weather, construction defects, there is a slew of things that, yeah, maybe a building's hitting our EUI because it's only 70% leased and 30% of it's not occupied. Um, so they're doing really good. So I think there's a ton of questions around this and that's really where, like Katrina said, get involved in these, in these task forces and the city is looking to us to help them with this. Okay, so let me go to questions. I think a lot of them had this, so. Um, so big concern about EUI targets. Yeah, so yeah, I think there's a lot of liability there. I think it's a big question. I think it's gonna bring a lot more liability into our industry and it'll be really interesting. I think of the, I think we're in for a really interesting time over the next 10 years. And then I think Celeste answered one of the questions.
Craig's question, yeah, so there's a lot of mandatory control requirements. I think the city gets that. They A lot of the discussions around this last code cycle were on those. So like getting, um, if you have a low enough lighting power density, you don't have to meet their controls requirements. Not all of that made it in there, but I know there's discussion on that. So again, um, at those meetings, you can kind of bring that up. Uh, yeah, and then I think, Caitlin has a great question here, right? If we normalize everything, but then we know this building isn't going to be like that, what, how, you know, do we have the freedom to change all that to try to do our best to accurately model the, the building we're actually working on? Um, again, great question. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, and then Matthew, yeah, um, I don't know that exact answer other than contacting Katrina, but I, th I think she um, mentioned it, but Katrina's office, if you contact them, you can get involved in, in all of those. Um, I do not believe you have to- I just add resident. a comment. The task force is a group of people selected and they went through a whole vetting process and tried to have diversity and have different, uh, different entities represented. So that actual participation, like coming to the meetings is not an open forum, but all of the information is publicly available on their website. Yeah, sorry. So. Great clarification, Celeste, and I'm gonna run through here to get handed over to you, I'm going too long. But um, yeah, so there's committees and then the task force. So the task force, yeah, is, is a lot, um, like Celeste said, all that. And then the city has committees asking for input, right? Just from professionals in, in the community. And that's where you can volunteer, right? So, and, and give input through that mechanism, but not through the task force. Good clarification. Um, sorry, so sorry if that was confusing. So, uh, prescriptive path, just, I think there's a lot of issues here too, how they're going to like even it up with an EUI. I think that's difficult to do. Um, but the city, you know, that's, that's going to be the a big step in this next code cycle as well. And then real quick, GBO, everyone always asks about GBO. I don't know the answer to this. So GBO was a voter. So we've kind of been talking about this already with the taxes. So GBO was voter approved. So the city can't necessarily just mess with the GBO, right? That, that was a voter approved regulation. The city can mess with the energy code to meet their goals. They get the GBOs on top of that and it helps them meet their goals. But I don't see the GBO because of that going away anytime soon. Um, this is an old chart, not very helpful, but uh, basically, you know, a lot of people use decreased energy consumption under the last code. As the codes get harder, that gets way, way harder. So we're seeing more people do certification, um, and other pathways through here because as the energy code gets hard, it's harder to be 5% or 12% um, above it. I, and I think Celeste will talk more about electrification, but um, really looking at that chart, right? They wanna get more and more electric ready, um, have these different options here. Uh, th these are the charts, right? So they're 2021 electric ready, have some electric equipment requirements in the next few cycles, just kind of blasting through this. Really, my takeaways here, I think the major hurdles, heating, right, not impossible. Katrina talked about some of those issues, domestic hot water heating, the industry kind of needs to catch up there with heat pump efficiency. And then I think the last tier that's going to be really hard is, you know, those process loads. People don't want to give up their fireplaces, your snow melt, your pools, um, all those other things. And I know other places are dealing with that, but Denver also, you know, is a difficult climate um, for that as well. So with that, uh, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Celeste to give her some time to run through her slides. Sounds good. Thanks, Taylor. All right. So I'm talking on existing buildings, which Probably a lot of modelers spend more time with new construction, but all new construction becomes existing buildings. And these, what the city's looking at will impact uh, both, um, or as buildings become existing. So um, what the city currently has is just the benchmarking ordinance along with the green building ordinance. The green building ordinance, it only applies when you get a roof replacement. And as Taylor mentioned, this was passed by the voters and it was a, supposed to be a green roof. And so it's all tied to replacing your roof. So there really hasn't been a lot of progress through the green building ordinance. There is an energy program where existing buildings can enroll early, but they really have not seen a lot of voluntary participation. So that leads into 
uh, the what the task force is trying to do. So there was a lot of good questions around what the task, the climate action task force intended to do, what they were required to do, how that related to the tax. There, that task force was partially convened because there was a tax or there was a, an issue that was going to go on the ballot that uh, I guess the, the city wanted a different recommendation. So the task force went through the whole process, uh, made a lot of recommendations and ended, their main recommendation was to propose it as a sales tax, which was not how the initial tax pr proposition started. So they did get that passed. And as Katrina mentioned, that now gives the funding to do a lot of great work. The recommendation of the task force was to have these targets. Um, so a big part of that being in buildings. So the Energized Denver Task Force is now kind of a follow-up to try to meet those recommendations. How are we gonna get there? So the Climate Task Force made recommendations. Now we need some more teeth. The benchmarking is great. We get disclosure, but it's not moving the needle. People are not volunteering for the energy program. Some people are making improvements, but we're not seeing a big decrease in building energy. So we want to have building performance policy to make that happen. So the task force we're currently, um, one of the things we're doing is looking at policies in other cities. So here are some examples. I've categorized them into two sets, one being performance policies. So you have some examples here where people, different cities are looking at greenhouse gas emissions, Energy Star, EUI. Uh, this one's a really interesting one from Montgomery where they're looking at the, uh, it's an EUI target kind of like Taylor was showing for different building types, but they're saying that they have a target that is out in 2035. So close to 15 years from now. And where you're at on that, so this, is, this would be each individual building has a different goal line. So everybody's got to get to 50 in 2035, but if you're at 100 EUI right now, you have a steeper line, but you don't have to be as efficient in the next cycle as a building that was already at 60. So I think there's a lot of interest around this model. I have all of the same questions that everybody put in the chat about the modeling of all of these buildings are different. We have so many situations. We see a floor go unleashed and it'll, and it'll totally change the energy use, plug loads, data centers, all these things impact and make every building unique. So well, I think this is an, an interesting one that at least it's not every building has the same target in 2022. Um, it still has a lot of the same challenges. The state of Colorado, they are putting forth a, a proposed bill. Uh, was, um, Sweep is a, a big player in that to get that on in front of the uh, Colorado, uh, in front of the state. And this one includes a lot of options. So this one's kind of a little bit of everything. You can have an energy star score, you can have an EUI target, you can have an EUI reduction. You can also, what they're proposing is that you could also do an energy model to show that the building meets IECC or ASHRAE. So this again, like some of what Taylor presented, this is not, this is not real yet. It's a proposed bill, but it could be interesting if it moves forward. Um, and there's also a, a lot of different prescriptive options. So Boulder is an example where they're requiring energy audits, uh, retro commission lighting upgrades. So that, that's a, a, a common suite of things that cities are finding that is palatable and effective and cost effective for cities to do these sets of measures. So where the task force is at is for our next meeting is looking at these examples and starting to formulate, do we want a performance first policy, maybe with prescriptive options. Do we want a prescriptive first where uh, you have to do certain things? Some of these do have kind of a performance out. So in Boulder, if you have an energy start score of 75, you don't have to do all the prescriptive measures. Um, so that um, is where the task force is at right now. I think we have some questions. I might have to follow that up in a second. Um, so, and then the performance-based could be interesting where 
if people are trying to get to a target, they might need to do energy modeling to figure out how to get to that target, especially if it's a pretty aggressive target. If they have to get down to a, a 55 in 10 years from now, they've got some time, but that might require some pretty significant upgrades. Uh, modeling is also good just for deep retrofits in general of trying to look at measures that interact. Things like lighting or motors, things like that, we can do a lot of that in spreadsheets, but um, modeling does come more into play as you get further and more aggressive. Similar to the code comments, actual EUI for a lot of these performance measures, there's different variations, be it emissions, energy star, KBTUs per square foot, but all of them are looking at the actual EUI. And new buildings go straight, or yeah, new buildings go straight into becoming existing buildings. So if these performance policies will pass, that building is going to have to comply. Hopefully new buildings have a better shot at meeting the performance targets, but these EUI, building EUIs will become uh, more necessary to be accurate, but there um, are a lot of challenges to that as we've seen in the chat and everyone who is in the modeling world understands. Um, do a little bit more on what the task force is doing. Uh, this is a tool that uh, Group 14 prepared to help make these decisions. So this is kind of that chart that Katrina had there to see the where we want to go. So the green line is the target. And this tool allows interaction where you can play around with, what if I do this? How aggressive do you have to be? And how much of those solid bars get turned into open bars to meet that goal? Fortunately, our utility, we get this whole, the top of all these bars is kind of freebie from Excel Energy. So the city will get that pretty much if they do nothing. Excel will save all that emissions for them. And we're trying to tackle the rest of it. Uh, so the existing fossil gas heating, which um, is a recent conversion, we're all getting used to saying fossil gas heating, those of us working with Denver, is how they want to refer to not natural gas, but just any uh, fossil gas would all be included. Uh, Katrina made good points that it can be on cost parity. This is a study that we did that showed you can have similar net present cost between heat pumps and replacement. And this is only comparing end of life. Uh, so it's just, if you're going to replace it anyways, you can get similar net present costs. But this was our study here focused on those low hanging fruit, easy to retrofit. So this was the the package drift top unit that comes off the building and goes back on. This is the single family home. Um, we are also doing studies for more substantial retrofits. So this was for a steam conversion study. This was contractor pricing and spreadsheet based modeling. And it's a challenge. We, for one, any replacement option is expensive. So making people spend half a million dollars if they weren't going to anyways is a tough sell. And uh, the lowest cost, the lowest first cost, and the lowest operating cost in this assessment was natural gas. Um, it's, and it's especially difficult to get the heat pump water heating. This is a multifamily building. Um, so I think there's a lot of, it's one going to be necessary to meet the goal, um, where you're going to have to get to 100%. That means everything. So we think that there's um, definite potential, but there's also a lot of hurdles to once you get into these bigger buildings, more complex, large central systems that are going to be much more difficult to turn to electrification. All right, blew through my slides. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to look at the chat here. So uh, Goku actually had a question um, right around when Taylor transitioned over to Celeste. And the question is, is Denver considering recalibration of models after the buildings have been operational over a period of time to check accuracy? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question, Goku. And I think that's what they're 
I think they want practitioners to do that, to then be able to better inform our models. But what the city wants is that when we give a code compliance model, that that's, you know, kind of built in <laughs> is what they're hoping. I, I think this is the big leap that our industry needs to make, right? Is how do we go from modeling, uh, building on a design to a fictitious baseline to show compliance to trying to model what's actually going to be built and and having an understanding of if that building can meet these EUI targets that the city wants uh, their buildings to meet to meet their carbon reduction goals. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the hard part. It's like the spirit of it is good because they want actual low energy. They don't want, yeah. they don't want you to just calibrate your model and be like, oh, well, there's a bunch of people and they're running 24 seven and now my model matches the building. Well, they want the building to use less energy. Um, so I think that, I, I understand the spirit, but I think there are a lot of challenges that will come when people are actually trying to meet specific EUI numbers that are not ones that look like one size fits all, but they're really not. Not every office building is the same. Yeah, and it's complicated, but it's, yeah, I agree with Celeste. I think it's amazing that our industry is finally, you know, there's all those articles of how lead buildings perform worse than non-lead buildings and all this stuff. And I think with all these carbon goals, the industry is really looking, and the city for sure, and a lot of other cities is looking towards performance, right? Um, so I, I think it's inspiring. Hey, hey, Taylor and Celeste, um, have you seen that kind of ASHRAE 90.1 2016 kind of almost seems like a step back when we're trying to explain our process to design teams and building owners. Um, and then just kind of the issues with the PCI calculation, not, not having an electric baseline. Um, also kinds of seems to work against us as we're trying to, you know, I always try to recommend electrification. I almost had to switch a client back to a gas system just so they could meet energy code, which I'd already done all the work convincing them to go all electric. It just seems a little backwards. Yeah, I could complain about this all day, Jacob. I think everyone's scratching their head. ASHRAE has always been that pinnacle of energy modeling, right? They've had the best methodology. I think PCI is an issue because of electrification, right? So Denver, Colorado is always a gas baseline. And then you're doing percents of percents that don't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. You're trying to explain to a client that, yeah, so it's it's not just that we're, you know, we're 50% better than the baseline, but we have to then be, you know, 15% better than the PCI calc, which is a percent of a percent. And then you end up with no percents left of your energy to save anything from I honestly we've had the same experience I don't think it aligns with any of these um, carbon goals that the city has um, so it's hard to know what to do but it is a good you know they've always had the most robust methodology um, I think that's one of the reasons Boulder kind of just like made their own code I don't know if that's you know, yeah, I mean, I just wish if you put EUI instead of dollars into a PC, into the same PCI equation, that at least lets you make a little more sense. But yeah, the, that's not in the code. <laughs> yeah, and when we were going through this first round, the um, there was a lot of conversations about that because you can do source energy as an energy code pathway right now in Denver with uh, following ASHRAE. Um, you cannot do site. So the, 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 the numbers, I don't, I forget what they are, but the, you know how you have your climate zone and your building type and it gives you a number that you chop off your, you know, savings basically with, um, they don't have those as at least of last year for site energy. Um, so I think that's another, I think once they do, but again, I think I agree with you. It's a struggle to explain what PCI is to anyone um, and why it matters. <laughs> so. Cool, it's like a lot of great comments. There's specific questions, but feel free to pipe in if. Uh, uh, this is Matt Dalhausen here. Uh, I work at the National Renewable Energy Lab and I've, I've designed um, 
from the modeling side, uh, several dozen net zero energy buildings. And uh, my I guess, comment sort of question there, are we gonna stick with this net zero EUI target? Um, I'm finding that's increasingly no longer helpful. Um, it's very easy to do net zero now, uh, in my opinion, um, but that doesn't mean net zero emissions and it doesn't get at that last mile problem where you're gonna need a lot of uh, renewables in that in like say peak heating warm-up scenarios where it's going to be really hard uh, to do that if you don't like think about that from the start yeah so you're saying that once you are getting to net zero do you really have to have an eui target is that what you're well i i, I just if the challenge is getting to 100 percent emissions free like building sector along with grid um, EUI stops being a useful metric. Right. Uh, now that solar is like less than a dollar a watt, um, it, it's, it's like the challenges are all in this last mile problem at specific time, like the time of use question is extremely important. And that the net zero energy calculus does not consider that at all. So for reference, California, what they do, I, I, I'm on a group there that, that is figuring this out in California. Um, they have a metric called time dependent valuation uh, mm -hmm. where the, and I'm not sure how many uh, people on the call are familiar with it, but basically um, there's like a multiplier based on your gas and electric usage, which will tell you uh, how much, roughly how much emissions that you have. And you have to design to a, a TDV target, which weights it rather than a net zero target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that would be really good information to share. I, and that's it on or take it to Katrina too. I think that is one of the as you look like we've had a lot of discussions, I know, with the, the task force and with a subcommittee of the task force of why does it matter how much energy people are using per square foot on site if we're trying to save emissions? That if you can generate as much electricity as you're using. But that is so that's also a good point that it's not just on net how much you're generating and using. It also matters when you're using it. So it might still be a problem if you're using too much at different times. Uh, it, it's, I think it's also hard to do this over time where efficiency right now is really important and we should care of how much energy per square foot people are using. But once we move into a more and into a cleaner grid, which will be 80% clean in 2030. Why do we have to have so much emphasis on people wasting energy as long as they're using electricity and not producing emissions? Yeah, and I think Matthew, we talked about, you know, so that's been brought up a lot. I think the other thing that was brought up a lot is since the city is focusing on emissions, what about embodied carbon? Um, you know, so there's a lot of, I think, carbon questions that are on the next frontier. Uh, I would challenge that net zero is not here. That's it's easy. I would say it's a lot easier than it used to be, but for the typical building in Denver, right? It is still this crazy thing to think when they tell developers that they're gonna require net zero, which really truly is a net zero, it's not net zero site. Um, that's still a big stretch. And, you know, so like the time, what California does, Excel, we've been like, they don't even necessarily have that information um, you know, so that, like that's again, like behind, right? That Excel doesn't know what they're, um, I, I think they do, but they don't publish it at least. And I know Jamie was working on trying to get it. Maybe he found it. But so there's a lot of work I think Colorado needs to do and the industry here needs to do to get caught up to some of the things that other people are doing. And yeah, to, to have that forward looking lens of we do know that just because you're net zero does not mean you're carbon zero. And if, and if, the emissions is the goal when you start looking at those things. Right, and I, I did get information on the New York policy is one of the only that specifically says emissions and uh, New Buildings Institute says that is the least, everyone hates it, that it's super complicated. You get into all these time of use and who's really emitting what and what emissions factors you apply. Nobody gets it, nobody knows how to comply with it. It's a moving target. So um, I was more in favor. I like the idea of the emissions targets, but I think it is a complex question to get into timing and renewables and time of day and different seasons. And yeah, really good. Yeah. 
I, 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 guess, I just wanted to add, sorry. <laughs> no, go for it. Um, thank you. I was just going to add that when we say, why do we care if we're consuming this much electricity because we're net zero, I think um, another perspective is to look holistically, right? If we're talking about embodied energy, then the more solar panels and wind turbines we have, the more embodied energy it contains. So I think maybe uh, once it's built and operating, that's not an issue, but just to build it, how much energy did it take? It's quite a bit. Yeah, good point, Axel. And Devers also made that argument, like when we've had those discussions of, it's harder to get to 100% renewable energy when everyone's using too much energy or using more energy than they should. So. There are a lot of aspects too. Energy efficiency does matter. I think what I struggle with is that does it matter as much? And these targets could be pretty, or these penalties could be pretty hefty and really hard to meet depending on your building type. Yeah, I, I guess one one point I'll, I'll say about this is like, I think there's some even targets at the national level to try to decarbonize the good pretty quickly in the next sort of 15 to 20 years. And if we're not gonna get that from the building sector, then we're gonna be relying pretty heavily on other, like the power sector to do that with batteries and other very expensive options. So if we want buildings to contribute, like, I mean, buildings that are gonna be, any code that's gonna be implemented is like maybe still five years away. And that's not a lot of time to build new buildings that would be a appreciable part of the load. So if we want buildings to help solve that last mile problem, assuming we're going to be net zero in like 25 years on the grid, uh, that has to be done today. Um, the other option is just say, let's just focus purely on the electrification problem and just hope that the grid solves it. And if it's expensive to do it on the grid because we didn't think about it in buildings now, well then that's just a cost society is gonna pay. Um, yeah. Um, I just, <laughs> And I think, so just from a de developer's perspective, right? They're gonna say, yeah, but I can't get a finance for this project if you make me do, make it X percent more expensive, right? I get, it doesn't go. Um, so I think that's what Denver is trying to, that's what everyone's fighting, right? They're fighting their goal with the with the with with all their goals of tax revenue, everything else that, that revolve around development. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Cause yeah, exactly what you said, this code, won't get it, you know, the buildings built off this 2021 code will probably not even be constructed until 2024, you know? So so we're already there by the time they're actually in operation. So you are on this huge delay. Yeah, I, I get that. And I know there's gonna be pushback from developers. I mean, I, my thought on it is like, I've designed several sort of buildings here in Denver. Um, the developers just like as an industry have not like, really had much growth or advancement or like new technology or things that they've adopted, um, you know, in the past like century, <laughs> like they, they're just, they're just an archaic industry. And if we're just going to take it, that that's just going to be the way it is, then um, don't expect much out of the buildings industry is my thought. Um, but there are places that are doing, you know, they are pushing the developers really hard and they're getting a lot of um, good work out of that. Um, yeah, so through code, right? If you make it code, they have yeah. to do it. They figure out how to do it, but it's getting it in. Right. Yeah, the code is the balance and not. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, yeah, you see it. People can do it. It's, it's, it's just they have to think harder. I think efficiency is going to be a big part. And especially in the next five years, like that's, that's going to be what we can push for and control. It does have cost savings it's more realistic than electrifying some of these buildings in the near term. Um, so I think there's different ways to look at it and a lot of questions around EUI, is that the right metric? But it does seem like efficiency is gonna be a big focus and should be. Yeah, actually I have a question to everyone, I guess. I was wondering when we had the EUI conversation in schedules, um, it's almost like discouraging, right? Because if you have, say you have a building, same building type, but it's, it's being used more, it's being used 
let's say, go to the maximum 24-7. It's being used by more people, so it has a higher EUI. How does that get addressed, or will it be? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of good answers to that right now. There, I think there's some of these, like the state bill is doing the Energy Star option or the EUI in which Energy Star does allow you to put in different operating hours and different occupancies. When you just do the straight EUI numbers, you are discouraging dense buildings because they're gonna be more energy intensive per square foot but now you have to build more buildings and keep more space and cool more space for more people to have that low energy per square foot when maybe you could have gotten more out of your building. So I don't, I haven't seen a lot of, like in the building performance policy examples, there has not been a lot to adjust for that other than the ones that are using Energy Star, which have some adjustment. Yeah, and I think on the new construction X rule that, you know, it's, you can always do the baseline still. Um, the EUI is just an optional pathway. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a big issue. I mean, it's like, yeah, everyone loved dense buildings, right? We work was killing it <laughs> until a year ago. And then now all these office buildings have probably really yeah. nice low EUI. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you. Uh, what's going to be done to, um, I mean, one concern I have with the, the pressure on the EUIs is that uh, things like resiliency and air quality are going to be just forgotten about. Um, and we've seen the cost of that, the pandemic, and not worrying about uh, air quality, especially in buildings. Um, are, are there any measures in the updated code to uh, adopt some of the more uh, stringent requirements that other places have for calling for like balanced mechanical ventilation in, in residential buildings? Yeah, um, so that would fall more under the green code, the stretch code, kind of what Denver's calling it, uh, which is more, which follows the IGCC, if anyone's familiar with that, which is sort of like lead almost, right? So it, it takes into more and in, more into account than just efficiency. And Denver wants to adopt some of that, you know, looking at resiliency, looking at this stuff. But yeah, that was kind of what I brought up too, right? EUI, there's a lot of issues if you're just looking at EUI and not looking at how the building operates and the ventilation and everything. So I think Denver is looking at that with their green code, but it's not, it's unclear to me how that's going to be part of the energy code. Um, so I don't know that answer. And I have not yeah, seen Sorry, it. to add one more thing. Um, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, it almost like touches on the equity side because let's say you have affordable housing that houses more people. It will have a higher EUI most likely. Yeah. Yep. And that's a big question too. Like, should the affordable housing, you know, should we need way more affordable housing? So should we be putting added cost with efficiency measures on affordable housing. It, it, there's a lot of equity questions that get really complicated. Well, that's primarily a zoning problem, I think. Um, that's, I don't, I don't know how much the green code wants to target that, but. <laughs> uh, they wanna look at incentivizing, um, doing the stretch code, the green code with different incentives that could be change of zoning um, and a lot of things like that, but. It's, that's I think part of Katrina's next big thing is how they're gonna spend that money that the voters approved and what incentives they're gonna give and what help they're gonna to give to the industry. What about EUI per occupant hour instead of per square foot? I mean, that would, you know, attach energy use budget to a human being for an hour per hour instead of space in a building, which is, you know, the goal is to house humans. Yeah, yeah I think it's like a hard metric though to capture. Yeah, that's at the really hard to measure. At some yeah. point. Yeah, I think yeah. the UI. That like the city can't keep track of how many people are in buildings where they can get assessor's data and understand how big buildings are. I like that idea though. Yeah, yeah, I think EUI is because we have so much data on it, right? That's so many things use EUI, so that's the metric. I mean, just ask Google and Facebook where everybody is. 
<laughs> they know. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of. I mean, it's 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 interesting seeing a lot of these same conversations coming up that California's been talking about for a while. Um, and that, that that AUI question, especially, and, and how do you do this fairly? I think is one. Um, my my preferred approach is uh, just is more focused on the resiliency side. Is just have much more stringent codes for passive resiliency, uh, and then you get low energy use because of that. Um, I think there's going to be some serious pushback in a similar way that with autonomous vehicles, like when there's the first deaths from autonomous vehicles, there's a lot of pushback and, and regulations over that. We've already seen that. Uh, the same thing is going to be happen uh, with electrification of buildings, where as soon as there's some major power outages in the winter, like in Texas, uh, there's going to be major pushback about full electrification. Um, and there's really nothing in the code, um, or at least that I've seen these conversations that is going to prevent that pushback because it really is making the buildings less resilient, not having um, uh, multiple energy sources to you know, stay habitable. Yeah, but um, I, I've never got that specifically though, because no gas heating system can heat anything without electricity. You still need electricity. You'd still have to have electric backup to run the pump, to run the fan. Um, uh, it might be more feasible to have a backup, but you yeah. dig especially as commercial buildings, you have to have fans and pumps. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I do realize that's that's true. I, I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, well, this is definitely the case in New England, but I, I think that, like, if there's points of fail, like, the thing is, like, the grid, for instance, it can get, if it gets really bad, it can go down for months. If you, like, blow a synchronous generator, that's a huge synchronous generator, um, whereas something like, the, like, it's possible to get some emergency power going, and like, you can have a generator and most like hospitals do, they have generators and they can run that stuff if there's still a gas system, right? And same thing with homes, like people have generators. Um, that, that doesn't exist in the electric system. Uh, well, I mean, there are big generators, <laughs> but, but like, uh, you mean, I guess people could just have generators that they run, but then you still need other fuels for that. Um, and, and then you're relying on the fossil fuel infrastructure again to sort of provide that. Um, so this resiliency backing, I, I think is is still missing. And, and that's, I mean, my, my preference is like design in like habitability requirements with no active heating systems. Say it has to remain habitable and then you get good envelopes and then you don't, you know, you can design out heating systems in most residential buildings. And I've, and we've shown that. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's where you run into the commercial side. That's, you know, people don't, that's what people want but that's not what people want to spend money on, right? No one, it's way harder to sell currently. I think it can change as, as the industry changed, people understand this, but the, you know, people still want condos where their bathrooms full glass and everyone can see them use the restroom at night. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense, but people, developers are gonna follow what people are gonna spend money on, um, you know? So I think that's where that shift has to happen, uh, like you're saying, to require that. Yeah, I want to push back that it's much more expensive to do that. Um, it's we've known how to do it for a while. I've designed several several buildings like that um, without much significant cost premiums because you 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 put all the money in the envelope instead of the HVAC system. Well, and it's not much more. Ex it might not be much more expensive, but is it going to get the the lease rate per square foot right? Is your office going to be able to sell as much as the office that's floor to ceiling glass with views of the mountains? You know, I think that's what's happening in the industry right now. Um, it doesn't mean it can't shift, but that's what developers are used to. I mean, this is, this is yeah, it's a question of, of what you define as code. And, and I think this is this question of what do we expect out of our buildings, right? Like if you expect them to just be pretty, that's fine. We, we've long since like expected them to have roofs to prevent us from getting wet. We've expected them to at least control humidities, you know, so that we don't just have black mold growing everywhere. And that's like, in the mechanical code. But like, for instance, we don't expect there not to be unvented combustion appliances in the living space. Like that's still really common, even though some places are now outlawing it and it's been outlawed in some Europe for a while. I'm talking about specifically gas stoves. Um, I think some places are, are looking more at this resiliency question of we're expecting them to remain habitable amid, amongst power outages, right? Like, is that something we expect out of our building stock? And then there are these trade-offs, right? Um, and I think if we're clearing code, then I think it, you know, and people understand what that's from and what we're expecting from the stock, it's, I think it's easier to have that conversation. Great points. 
I'm sorry, I've been monopolizing this whole. <laughs> so I know, I know we're right up at the end. That was the, the kind of formal end time. Is that right, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. So a few more minutes if anybody else has some last questions. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> All righty. Well, thanks again to Celeste and Taylor for our presenters on our last two um, topics here. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen just to announce that we do have uh, another event planned for Sim Club next month. And that is going to be our annual student night presentations. Uh, we're going to have a combination of graduate students from both Colorado School of Mines in Golden, as well as the University of Colorado in Boulder, share 90 minutes to go over their graduate level research. So that'll be May, uh, what's the date on there? So I got this Zoom thing in my way. <laughs> May 20th, on a Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. And we hope that some more of you folks can join us next month. Thanks, Until then, everybody thanks everybody for, the for attending. Discussion. Thanks to our presenters, and everybody take it easy. Thanks, Aaron. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.